And now we're gonna welcome Barry Crash, the president of the EV Club of Connecticut, our last speaker. Uh, as you have heard, I'm also with the EV Club of Connecticut and I will speak uh, this evening uh, a little bit about the club, about driving electric, um, a bit of a deeper dive into charging minutia, and um, I'll briefly uh, skate through some incentive material. So this is how we see ourselves at the club. We try and speak to as many people as we possibly can about the benefits of driving electric. We are a source of uh, information for consumers, for press, uh, public officials, and, uh, and other organizations. We're also advocates. We interact with municipal, uh, state, and uh, to some degree, even federal officials. Um, and finally, data is a big part of what we do. So we track uh, detailed stats about EV adoption in Connecticut. It's all published out to the website in a 28 page dashboard. And we track other things as well. Um, for example, I have a uh, Freedom of Information Act request with DEEP where I get <clears throat> cheaper rebates by dealership. And this is uh, something that we use as a proxy for EV friendly dealers for those dealers who are selling cheaper eligible vehicles. So this is a shot of, um, of our club in action. Uh, EV showcases. Uh, the map on the bottom right, that thing is really annoying, isn't it? I'm not sure how to get rid of it. Um, and uh, so that is showing the number of uh, EVs by city throughout the state. And then uh, in the lower left is uh, the Tesla police vehicle that was purchased by the Westport police for use as a patrol car. And that was the financial analysis that I had uh, referenced earlier. So these are some of the things that um, are a barrier to um, EV adoption. And uh, we'll get into um, each of them to some degree in the presentation. So next slide. This is a graphic that I grabbed from the New York Times who in turn sourced it from carboncounter.com. And I just thought it was a very good illustration of the fact that electric vehicles are the cleanest cars on the road but they are also the most cost-effective cars on the road. Next slide. And the reason they're cost-effective is that it is much less expensive to operate a vehicle on electricity relative to gasoline. Uh, it varies by car, but the uh, cost per mile on electricity is typically four to six cents per mile given Connecticut electric rates. Uh, and with current high gas rates, the cost to operate an internal combustion engine vehicle is closer to 15 cents a mile. The other reason that uh, EVs are less expensive to own is that the maintenance profile is lower. An EV has roughly 90% fewer moving parts. There are thousands of moving parts in an internal combustion engine, all of which require regular maintenance and uh, replacement that you just don't have with an electric vehicle, which is basically a battery uh, and some electric motors with a car that surrounds it. Every electric vehicle has regenerative braking. So what happens is when you take your foot off the accelerator, the engine slows the vehicle down and stores some of that kinetic energy into the battery. And in some cars, the regen can bring the car to a complete stop. It's usually configurable in most models. And EV driving is often one pedal driving. And as a result, you're just not using your brakes. And it's not uncommon for a set of brakes to last between 70 and 100,000 miles. So next slide. Um, Annalisa, I'll turn it back to you for this slide, but I just wanted to make the point that the biggest pain point with um, EVs right now is uh, mining the, the lithium, the nickel, and the cobalt that goes into the car. So recycling is, uh, is a critical component for us to move forward in a sustainable way. Right, and sourcing has become very complicated. I don't know if everyone's following the news, but Tesla is trying to move to a cobalt-free battery. Um, most of cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Um, Freeport McMoran, an American company, owned those mines. They sold them to the Chinese. The Chinese now control the cobalt supply globally, almost. Um, it's, it's not a good situation. Um, and so, you know, Biden wants us to secure the supply chain, but Freeport McMoran sold the mines, what, a, a year ago. I, it's kind of crazy. So we are playing catch up big time with the Chinese. We know that the only way that we are going to continue to build EVs is, is if we can source the materials and source them more sustainably, obviously, because we don't want child labor as part of the mix, um, as well as do the recycling. The good news is, is that the US government, the UK government, many manufacturers are already on it and have been on it. Tesla is already doing um, work with uh, Panasonic, their EV partner, and Redwood Materials in their um, uh, Gigafactory to do recycling right on the factory floor. That's sort of where you start with it. Um, it. It has to grow. It has to be done affordably at scale. And that is the challenge because there are different form factors of the batteries. Um, and it takes a long time to take them apart. So they're talking about doing it robotically. There's a lot of R&D money behind this, Renault. Um, Tesla recycles all their batteries. Nissan takes, uh, EV batteries from the LEAF that are no longer usable and turns them into stationary storage. Um, we have a company in Connecticut that's starting to do that. Are those available for incentives? That's a big question. And the Connecticut Green Bank was at the event where I was. So that's being opened up there as well. Um, and they also convert vehicles, uh, ICE vehicles to EV. Inductive Auto Works is the name of the company. And um, the question was posited to the Green Bank there as well as to you know, how those vehicles could become eligible for cheaper rebate, for example. Um, VW opened their own batteries recycling plant in January of this year. And then the Tesla Shanghai Gigafactory is adding a whole battery and electric motor repair and recycling facility. So they're integrating it as part of their production process, which is really important. And then just in terms of technological breakthroughs that will make that affordable at scale recycling possible is the Faraday Institution that uh, developed a recycling method to actually take the, um, the cathode and the anode and apply ultrasound to them to remove all these really valuable materials, the, the nickel, lithium, cobalt, manganese, copper, obviously. Uh, so so this, this has to happen. So if anyone says to you, oh, we have a recycling problem, you're absolutely right, we sure do. And we know we do, and we need to solve it. Otherwise, there, there is not an infinite amount of this material on the planet. It has to be recovered and reused. Charging an electric vehicle is in parlance referred very simply to level one, level two, level three. So the um, plugs that you see at the top of the slide are four of the five plugs that are used in this country today. On the left is a J1772 uh, level two plug that's used for every non-Tesla and then the three fast charging plugs, the uh, CCS, the Chatamo, and the and the Tesla plug, and we'll talk more about these. But level one is simply plugging it into a socket in your garage. You can charge a car that way, there's nothing wrong with it. Level two is using a 240 volt EV charger. You can install one of these in your home, but you will also see these in public parking lots or hotels or shopping areas. And these come in a range of power. They can be anywhere from 16 to 80 amps. And then level three is the so-called fast charging, where the uh, current bypasses the onboard charger in the vehicle and shoots high-powered current directly into the battery. Charging sessions for an 80% charge are anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. It depends on the car and it depends on the charging unit. Next. So charging at home. The main point I want to make here is that there are a lot of older homes in Connecticut with 15 amp outlets in their home. If you buy an EV and you think you're going to be charging this way, it's worth getting the electrician to install a 20 amp line if you don't already have one. That way you'll be able to charge 40 or even 50 miles um, overnight. 
and that's a that's a lot that's a fair amount of charging uh, for a lot of people if you go to the next slide it raises the question of whether you even need a charging station so there are two types of evs on the market there are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles uh bevs are like the teslas they are 100 percent electric the range of the evs nowadays uh, can range anywhere from about 150 miles to as much as 500 miles in some of the new extremely expensive vehicles but the sweet spot is between 200 and 350 miles plug-in hybrids have much smaller battery packs they in some cases get as few as eight miles or on the high end they'll get about 45 miles but you can fully charge a plug-in hybrid with trickle charging overnight. And um, even if you have a BEV, uh, if you're not driving that much, trickle charging might be enough for you. Um, and you can supplement it with occasional charging sessions in the wild. But if you do think you want a level two charging station, this is just um, a few examples from one company. Now, these are smart chargers which means that they're wi-fi connected and they're two of them are 40 amps and one is 48 amps and you can see the price on these is around 600 dollars. so they're not really that expensive uh, next if you are going to install a charging station it requires that you pull a 240 volt line from your panel to the garage the thickness or the heaviness of the line will depend on how much power you're pulling to the charger. So as I said before, there's quite a range of power available. The sweet spot nowadays seems to be 30 to 50 amps, most typically around 40 amps, which allows you to charge at about 38 miles an hour. And um, there are the two plugs, the J1772 and the Teslas. Now this bullet point on the bottom is how to determine the power of the charging unit to buy if you want to be able to charge your EV at the fastest speed that it's capable of being charged. Okay, that was a little bit of a mouthful. Every EV has a component called an onboard charger. The purpose of the onboard charger is to convert the AC current to DC current for the battery and to regulate the flow of power coming in from an AC charger. Um, different cars are engineered to accept different rates of charge. So if you have a slow car plugged into a high powered unit, the onboard charger will prevent you from frying the battery. So this formula is simply the kilowatt hour of the onboard charger. And I'll use the Tesla as an example. It happens to be 11.5 kilowatts. Now we wanna take the kilowatts and turn it into watts. So we multiply it by a thousand. And we divide it by the 240 volts, and that will give you 48 amps. So to charge a Tesla at the maximum speed it's able to be charged in, a, in an AC current environment, you would need to buy a 48 amp charger. It does, if you bought a more powerful charger, the car will not charge any faster. And you can buy a less powerful charger. It'll just charge a little more slowly. Next. The first thing I recommend doing is starting with an electrician, even before you buy the charger. And the first thing he'll do is look at how much room you have in your panel. You may be getting all jazzed up about installing a fast 50 amp charger, and he might rain on your parade and say, sorry, if you want to do that, you're going to have to upgrade your electric service. And that will set you back at least a uh, James Madison. He's on the $5,000 bill. And um, the circuit has to have extra capacity. So if you're going to install a 40 amp charger, you need a 50 amp circuit. If you're going to install an 80 amp charger, you would need a 100 amp circuit. That's a lot of power. Um, the cost of what this project, the total cost of the project will be affected by the cost of the hardware. You saw an example a couple of slides ago. The, the thickness of the wire that you have to get and how far the uh, panel is from your garage. And then you'll have to decide between a hardwired charger 
versus um, a plug-in charger. And before we go to the next slide, one of the updates that I had made in the deck that you didn't see is that there is a new device that some manufacturers are making. And this device allows uh, the charger to share a circuit with another 240 volt device like a dryer. So if you were to dry a load of clothes, it would turn off the, um, the car charger. And that might be uh, the answer to avoid expensive upgrades. So next slide. So hardwired versus plug-in, I generally recommend hardwired. First of all, if the charger is more than 40 amps, you don't have any choice. Or if you're putting the charger outdoors, it has to be hardwired. And there's no risk of plug wear and it's slightly faster. The main use case for um, a plug-in charger, it plugs into um, a NEMA plug, like a dryer plug, is that they're portable. And if you think you're going to be moving, you would be able to unplug the charger and take it with you. Next. For level three chargers, the fast charging that you want to do on a road trip, first of all, if you have a plug-in hybrid, these vehicles do not accept level three charge. The whole use case of a plug-in hybrid is that the electricity might take you somewhere between 20 and 40 miles. And if you're making a longer trip, the car will just, the car has a gasoline engine and it will just drive like a typical ICE car. So you won't be driving zero emissions, but you won't get stranded. So the fast chargers are for the battery electric vehicles. And those are, those are the three standards. Um, Chatamo is likely to be gradually going away. That's the Japanese standard that came here when Nissan, when Nissan first started importing the Leaf. But um, that particular Betamax VHS war is over and um, CCS is the winner and even Nissan has switched to uh, CCS equipment uh, in its cars. Now, um, in Europe, Tesla uh, makes a, an adapter so that you can plug a Tesla into a CCS charger. In this country, they sell a Chatamo adapter. I'm not sure what the point of it is since it's fairly expensive, about $450. Um, but you may have read that Tesla's considering opening up, opening up its networks to other vehicles. So these adapters are going to start becoming more common. And just one other point, which is that Tesla does something that's quite clever and I'm sure the others will copy it. And that is with a lot of EVs, you're able on the screen in the car to see where the nearby charging stations are. And if you tell Tesla where you're going to charge when you're about 10 minutes out from the station, it will precondition your battery so that when you plug in, the charging will begin right away. Every EV requires some time to precondition the battery. So the point of this is that it reduces your dwell time at the charger by about 10 minutes or so. Next. So these are some examples of onboard chargers. The trends in EVs are uh, moving towards larger battery packs, uh, better battery technology that's more energy dense. So the range of the EVs has been increasing. And that's why you're seeing cars with 250, 300, 350 mile and greater ranges. However, if a battery has a greater range, it takes longer to charge it. So now the manufacturers are beginning to install faster onboard chargers that can take a higher degree of current. So I mentioned that Tesla was 11.5 and you see the VW and the Ford and the Rivian are similar. And the, the new uh, Lucid Air and the F-150 the F-150 Lightning have 19.2 kilowatt onboard chargers, which means if you want, which means that it would take an 80 amp uh, level two unit to maximize the charging for that vehicle. Um, of course, a lot of that onboard charging capacity is intended to be used at level three chargers to reduce the time spent as much as possible. Next. The other important piece of technology that's coming on the horizon, and I'd like you to think back to that complex slide that uh, Annalisa showed you about everything being wired to everything else, is that uh, the vehicles are, are one component um, of that network. So Ford is actively marketing the fact that the battery in an F-150 Lightning 
can power your home for up to three days. It requires a, a special bi-directional home charger, but this is the this is the first vehicle that's advertising that capability. Or actually, I say I should say one of the first two. Lucid has introduced uh, what they call V to X platform, which means vehicle to anything. So it could be vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, or vehicle to vehicle. And Rivian has also announced a vehicle to vehicle uh, charging mode. So next, I think we're getting near the incentives. Um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on the incentives, but incentives are likely to become a lot more complicated in the very near future. The existing federal tax credit provides for um, a credit of up to $7,500. However, um, General Motors and Tesla have phased out of that credit because there's a manufacturing cap. Now the Build Back Better bill has a greatly reconfigured EV tax credit. They, they have the 7,500, then they have a, a bonus if the car is made in this country and another bonus, a bigger bonus if it's uh, made in a union factory. They're proposing to make the tax credit a, a refundable tax credit. So if you don't have the, ta the tax liability to use it, you, the, uh, the feds would cut you a check. Um, at an event I was at recently with the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, she said they were even contemplating turning that into a straight rebate so it could be cash on the hood. So we don't know where that bill is gonna land. We don't know if it's gonna pass, but there could be significant changes. The state purchase incentive program is known as CHEAPER. Uh, this provides for a maximum rebate of $2,250. There was a CHEAPER board meeting this afternoon that rebate was scheduled to sunset at the end of this year. It has been extended temporarily through the first three months of 2022. And there's um, a piece of analysis that uh, the consultant for the program is working on, and they're gonna be presenting that to the board in March, and they'll decide whether to make that rebate, uh, that higher level of rebate permanent uh, not permanent, at least um, extended throughout the full year of 2022. My expectation is that'll happen because the program is is uh, pretty seriously underspent, and they and they have the money. Cheaper also introduced in June um, two additional rebates for income limited individual, a supplemental a supplemental rebate of uh, two thousand dollars for battery electric vehicles for a new vehicle and a $3,000 rebate for a used vehicle. Now, one of the big restrictions of, of cheaper is that there's um, an MSRP cap of $42,000. So if a car is more expensive than that, it's not eligible, but the definition of the cap is the price of the trim level. So if you buy a $40,000 car and you get the fancy hubcaps and you get the fancy stereo and the leather seats and it brings the cost of the car to 46,000, it actually would still qualify. So if you're looking at a vehicle and it's right around that price, you should go on the cheaper website and see if it's eligible and try to find out the, uh, the price of the trim level that you're looking at. Um, another change that Cheaper made this year is that they have raised the limit to two incentives per lifetime per driver. It used to be one. And if you had gotten a cheaper incentive prior to June, it resets. So you're allowed to get two more. And this incentive is only available to consumers, not to businesses um, or government or commercial. So next, for the last incentive we'll talk about is uh, part of, um, a component of what Annalisa was talking about earlier with respect to solar, but there's a component for electric vehicles. This is a really big program that uh, Pura is about to implement. And even though it's scheduled to become effective in January, uh, the final document still has not been issued, at least for EVs. I checked on the uh, Eversource website um, as recently as yesterday, and there was nothing there yet. So Pura developed these incentives, but, but you will be getting them through the utilities. And there are incentives that apply to residential, to commercials, to single family, to multiple unit dwellings, to workplace, to municipal 
uh, for fleets with extra kickers for lower income communities and for underutilized circuits. And in the next slide, uh, I have an example for you of the first draft of what the residential incentive looks like. So this is only single family residential. And the, there is an incentive to subsidize the cost of the hardware um, up to $500 um, and up to $500 to subsidize the cost of the installation. So it's a very significant incentive because what you saw earlier was that the the hardware that I showed you was about six or seven hundred dollars. It cost me about between nine hundred and a thousand to do the installation of my level two charger. So the five hundred would be about half of that. And then if you take advantage of the incentives for the chargers, you are required to enroll in their managed charging program. And in order to do that, you need a smart charger and the utility is able to talk to the charger. And what's in it for them is that you give them permission to throttle your rate of charge if you're plugged in during a very high demand period, which will occur on a hot day between June and September. And if you do that, they will give you um, um, up to $200 a year. And then they have a couple of other ways to get it too if you're if you already have a charger, if you're like me and you already have a charger installed and it's a dumb charger, they can work through the telematics of the vehicle and you can still enroll uh, for the incentive. And why don't we go to the next slide? I think we're just about done and we are. 